This channel is only possible thanks to direct contributions from viewers like Kronos, Karazun Magi, Argus, Milk, Bleed Red, Christopher Welch, and you. If you'd like to contribute to making more videos like this possible, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month on Patreon or by buying a t-shirt at the merch store. Thanks a bunch, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hey gang, Taz here, and welcome back to our Steven Universe Classback series, part two, in which we'll discuss the classbacks of Garnet and Steven. First, let's get to Garnet, who's going to require that I bend the rules a little when it comes to sticking to the classbacks that Ego Matters drawing assigns the cast. Seer of Time is a perfectly serviceable title for Garnet. A seer is one who sees and knows their aspect throughout all of existence, and uses this knowledge to inform and guide the people around her, like the old seers and oracles of Greek myth. This certainly lines up well with how Garnet uses her future vision. She sees time, and as a result has insight that makes her the effective leader for the rest of the team, who do what Garnet says to get the best results in any given situation. But that only really describes one specific function Garnet serves as part of the Crystal Gems, and while she's plenty knowledgeable in general about the ways of the world, I can't shake the feeling that it only describes part of her nature. See, more than implying a hero's potential superpowers, class specs are, at least to me, at their most interesting when they poetically suggest that the way a person's perspective or way of thinking impacts the world around them. And Garnet isn't actually one person with a single perspective on the world, but instead an ever-ongoing conversation between two people with very different skills and mindsets. A fusion. Luckily for us, Homestuck has precedence for fusion, so I'll handle Garnet much like the comic's best character, Dave Petta, who's made up of Napetta, the Rogue of Heart, and Dave Strider, the Knight of Time. Dave Petta seems for all intents and purposes to have access to the full heroic power sets of both heroes that combine to create them, and Garnet is, in the same way, every bit the sum of her parts, and then some. So I'm going to suggest that the Seer of Time title is actually the best fit for Sapphire, who fits the traditional mold of the Seer as imagined by Homestuck even better than Garnet does. Early in life, Sapphire is given to a certain jaded cynicism when she's left to her own devices. She can see all potential future timelines, or so she believes, and this gives her a sense of certainty that there's nothing in her life worth changing, or for that matter, that it's possible to affect meaningful change in the first place outside of the options that she's already aware of. This defeatist, passive attitude is really reminiscent of Aradia Megiddo, Homestuck's maid of time, who enters her story deeply depressed and bitter about the fundamental inflexibility of the timeline that she's stuck in, and her absolute inability to change it in any meaningful way. Seers are also really used to being listened to, and heeded, when they lay down their opinion on a subject, which, when they're at their worst, can result in them coming off as having a wiser-than-thou attitude and even being very judgmental of and coldly disattached from the people around them, even if in truth the seer cares very much. To counter and balance Sapphire, we enter Ruby, who I consider a knight of rage. As an aspect, rage represents many things, but it's probably best understood in relation to the emotion it was named for. Rage is not only the feeling of anger, it's also the unshakable, compulsive focus you feel when confronted by something so awful that you simply can't look away. In Homestuck, heroes of rage tend to be subject to world-shattering revelations that totally append their way of thinking about reality, forcing them to come face to face with the rotten foundations of a world that previously they thought at least neutral, if not outright positive, and forcing the hero, in turn, to decide whether they accept this unfair fate or flawed world as it is, or instead reject it entirely and devote all their efforts to seeing it undermined, destroyed, or renewed in some way. At its core, Rage is about the relentless drive to act, to solve a problem that is so infuriating it demands a solution, no matter the cost. From the first moment that births their relationship as Garnet, this is exactly what Ruby provides to Sapphire. She sees the cruel fate at Pearl's hands that Sapphire had already accepted for herself and firmly says no. The knight is one who serves others and protects them with their aspect, using their aspect as tool, shield, and weapon to enable the people they care about to stay safe and reach the highest heights they possibly can, which is exactly what Ruby is driven to do for Sapphire from the beginning. The knight can also be interpreted as one who outright gives their aspect to others, serving it to them like a delicious dinner on a silver platter. In this sense, too, Ruby provides Sapphire with rage. By being willing to take bold and decisive action herself, and proving to Sapphire that the network of futures that she sees in her mind's eye can be changed with enough effort, she gives Sapphire an insight with which she immediately sees through the inherent fakeness of both her own supposed omniscience and Homeworld's supposed moral righteousness, inspiring Sapphire to immediately leave Homeworld behind forever and choose Ruby instead. However, if the seer is guilty of occasionally being overly aloof and cold, 
then the knight could be fairly accused of being codependent to the point of thoughtless subservience at their worst. Not to mention endlessly self-victimizing and whiny when they feel they've been seriously wronged. Stubbornly wallowing in their own pity party. But while these differences do put Ruby and Sapphire in conflict once or twice in the story, these two gems have had thousands of years to get to know each other and sand off their own rough edges. Let's take a look at someone more inexperienced. Specifically, Steven, who's been assigned the title Page of Heart. Now, the page is a very special class in the lore of Homestuck. Pages are basically completely defined by the fact that they are, to begin with, very weak and needy characters who depend on those around them if they hope to succeed at whatever goal they have set out before them. But despite this handicap, they actually have the most sheer raw potential of any class, and can reach unparalleled heights of might and heroism if properly nourished and guided along their path. As the active mirror class to the knight, the page is also driven to protect, serve, and give to the people around them. But where the passive knight is motivated by raw, selfless devotion that can sometimes be outright self-destructive, the active page is motivated by the slightly greedier impulse to finally earn the respect and even admiration of their peers and role models. That's okay, though. The page makes up for his childish ambition with what's just about the biggest heart imaginable, one filled to the brim with kind and idealistic innocence that delights in all the pleasures and wonders of being alive, from the most mundane yet homely together breakfast to the most majestic and magical giant woman. Indeed, the page's open-mindedness and inherent likability tends to become their biggest skill, at least early on, which is their ability to make fast and staunch friends out of just about anyone they come across, friends who quickly grow to deeply care for the page and even want to protect or guide him themselves. This is an enormous asset for the page, who thrives in any scenario where people are willing to keep him safe, meet him where he is, and teach him how to rise up to their level. Though it can also land the page in an uncomfortable and treacherous situation if they come across a would-be guide whose methodology or tactics are a poor fit for him. Nevertheless, if they teach him, even if it's just by example, he will most certainly learn. Imitation is one of, if not the most powerful tool in a child's arsenal as they begin the perilous journey of learning how to manage adulthood, and in general, just being a person. Humans are designed to learn as much as possible by observing and imitating the actions of others, and the page is something like the ultimate distillation of that fundamental interpersonal skill. The story of Steven Universe is by and large the story of Steven growing up by observing, imitating, and eventually understanding and responding to the people around him, especially the Crystal Gems and Greg, who give him the foundation he needs to go on and establish relationships with all sorts of homeworld gems, which eventually turns the tide of the rebellion. Steven's greatest power is literally his ability to win over the hearts of those around him. Which brings us to the very on-the-nose heart imagery that pervades his entire character. I mean, he's literally the the heart of the Crystal Gems. Homestuck's heart aspect does indeed represent many of the ideas that would traditionally be associated with the symbol of the heart. Specifically in this case, feelings, and in particular, love. The heart aspect is juxtaposed against the mind aspect, which is the aspect of logic and reason. And so we can infer that the heart aspect is in turn about the often completely irrational and just as frequently completely uncontrollable urges and emotions that rule over us and our thought processes. And it's through the slow and messy process of coming to understand those forces that Steven learns to master both his own powers and the interpersonal compassion and perspective that he ultimately uses to usher in a new future for Gem and humankind. The heart aspect also describes the soul, the essence of the self, and in Homestuck tends to relate to ideas of splintered versions of a single person, and the consequences of fundamentally combining or splitting the souls of two or more people. This is obviously another way that heart can be read as empowering Stephen, as fusion, the ability to fundamentally combine his essence with those of the people around him, represents the single biggest power boost Stephen ever has access to. But it's also in the idea of the heart as a splintered existence that we find the true darkness of Stephen's relationship to his aspect because Steven spends most of his childhood quietly struggling with the idea that he's not so much his own person as a runty, confusing, maybe even unwanted leftover of the legendary, world-shaking presence that was his mother. At first, Steven is mostly just frustrated that he can't imagine living up to her example. But once he's learned more about his mother's complicated history with her own identity and her true nature as Pink Diamond, at around the same time that his empathy powers develop to the point that he starts being directly exposed to Pink Diamond's psyche, Steven's thoughts go to a much darker place. He begins to believe on some level that he literally is his mother, simply pretending to be him in an attempt to escape her own life. 
and even once he refuses with himself and finally proves that he is himself and not Rose or anyone else, finally achieving existential peace with the nature of his own existence, the shadow of that doubt still lingers with him, eventually manifesting in his desperate desire to distance himself from his mother and be as little like her as possible. A desire that he can't properly manage because he isn't properly letting himself feel or think about it comes Steven Universe future, where it manifests in increasingly destructive ways as he slowly loses control of his abilities and state of mind. Which finally brings us to the main character flaw of the page, precisely the aspect of Steven's character that allows his problems to get as bad as they do before he finally receives help in the epilogue. Which is that when the page is confronted with a reality that he simply doesn't want to or isn't prepared to deal with, he has a seemingly endless capacity to simply plug his eyes, cover his ears, and deny, deny, deny. Simply being trapped in a state of denial that there is a problem with regards to the page's situation is often said hero's biggest downfall, because it doesn't matter how much potential you have or how many allies you have at your side if, when faced with a problem, you simply choose to ignore and not deal with it. To run away from reality instead of facing it as well as the feelings that you carry within you. Luckily for Steven, even once his denial pushes him far over the brink, it's not too late to pull him back and begin the process of actually healing. That's gonna do it for this time, guys. I hope you enjoyed the ride, and until next time, keep rising! Huge thanks go out to my patrons for making this video possible. If you want to help support the channel and come join us at our awesome and growing Discord community, feel free to join us for as little as a dollar a month. You can also find me on the R Hive Swap Reddit and Discord. That's all for now, so thank you again, and as always, keep rising.